demand number one is an adequate supply of energy regardless of any shortage or threatened embargo at low prices. Adequate in this sense really means limitless because no one wants rationing, right? And low prices means lower prices because no one wants additional taxes or a share of the burden of higher production costs. Demand number two is clean air, pure oceans, restricted mining alongside a full industrial production, as if the limitless fuel supplies could be had somehow by magical traceless osmosis and an active industrial economy could proceed without some atmospheric residues and terrestrial change. Demand number three is a continuation without threat of the high standard of living we have become all too accustomed to. And by threat, I mean everything and everybody that might conceivably upset the comfortable cocoon of any energy-consuming community in America. Now, I'll tell you another secret. There are things I want, too, for the most part, but they are unreal as demands in today's world. And it is the responsibility of rational elected officials to deal with them as unreal and come up with constructive, imaginative, but realistic alternatives rather than appeasing their constituencies. Convenience politics is appeasement politics, and when local government spills over into the national and international er arenas, the way it is happening today, the world and each individual locality is in grave danger. Professor Irving Crystal, editor of The Public Interest, put it very succinctly in a recent Wall Street Journal article. Congress is a creature of popular opinion which seeks to appease, never to refine or elevate. To take a longer or larger or more comprehensive view of political matters means to defer gratifications, to impose temporary sacrifices, to make decisions about what the nation needs as distinct from what the people at any moment may unthinkingly desire, precisely because Congress sees politics as the art of appeasing various constituencies, it can never be serious about foreign policy. Professor Crystal goes on to point out that this attitude is responsible for our floundering energy program. Congress, he says, persists in focusing attention on the economic costs of this program and the burdens it places on this program with the country or on this or that sector of the population. What it resolutely overlooks is that this is a foreign policy program, not a domestic economic program at all. He points out further that whatever energy programs you choose, they will be costly in the sense that they will represent a voluntary act of economic self-denial on the part of the American people in order to gain political freedom of action in international affairs. And it is predictable that Congress will conclude that such economic self-denial is unthinkable. It will not impose rationing. It will not impose qu import quotas. It will not even move to increase our oil production in the offshore Atlantic, lest it inconvenience New Jersey's summer resorts. So by dealing with the energy issue, which a fundament is fundamentally a critical international question affecting our economic security and worldwide relations, in terms of local appeasement politics, the Congress is playing a very casual, short-sighted game that endangers all of us by the long run letting their constituencies down too, and that includes all of us. So who's to blame? We've got to blame somewhere. The OPEC nations? No. We need a closer, more convenient scapegoat. One forty. How's that? Too fast? That's okay.